Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have M. Quentin Williams with me today. Uh, Q is the founder and CEO of Dedication to Community, D2C, a national nonprofit that works with law enforcement on training to serve communities better and also works with sports leagues and teams about mission and outreach. Q is the author of How Not to Get Killed by the Police. He is also a former FBI agent, federal prosecutor, uh, has held senior positions in the NFL, Jacksonville Jaguars, and the NBA. He earned his JD from St. John's and his bachelor's from BC, where he also played football. Q, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thankful to have you. So uh, take us back to the beginning, you know, where you grew up, uh, what your family situation was, what type of kid you were, things of that nature. Yeah, well, it started for me on the island of St. Thomas, where I was born, but I didn't stay there for too long. My mother uh, was abandoned by my my father, my biological father, when I was in utero. So at four months old, she takes us back to New York to um, what she had hoped to do was to reunite with her family because they disowned her. Uh, she she my mother's a white Jewish woman, and my biological father was a black Antiguan man. And at the height of the civil rights movement, for her to leave home and to get pregnant by a black man, not in wedlock, and it was just not a good situation. And her her parents weren't too happy, really. Her her mother wasn't too happy about it. So there was some reuniting that needed to happen, but it wasn't happening immediately. We, We moved to New York and lived in squalor for the first five years of my life. Uh, And then we did reunite with my grandparents. They became the best grandparents you could possibly have. My grandmother got over her insecurities about trying to please everybody. Uh, But, and and that that was really a turning point in my life. Uh, But we still were very, very poor, my mother and I, and later on my brother came and we grew up in Yonkers, New York. In Yonkers, New York, if you know anything about the history of Yonkers, it had a very has a storied history, and not necessarily good. The past is not necessarily good. What's going on there now is is fairly incredible, but drugs and poverty, despair, and bad education system, and that's what we what we had to grow up in. But we found we found greatness in the city because my educators were really caring, loving people. Coaches were caring, loving people. Uh, my mother surrounded us with good people. Relationships were at the center of our lives because although we didn't have many resources, my mother has this knack for building relationships that are lifelong relationships. So she she passed that down to my brother and me. And uh, I, I ended up through, uh, through some challenges against some odds because I had, I had a reading deficit. I ended up doing well in school, all effort. The intelligence level wasn't what my friends had, but I, was, I, I had this grit about me and got a football scholarship too. Played, played football, built up my body uh, and went to Boston College. I played with Doug Flutie for a couple of years And it really expanded my world when that happened, because I saw that my world was not as small as just my block. It was very expansive and got a degree in economics, graduated from BC with that degree. If I can, can I stop you just for a second? Um, You know, that's a it's a very interesting story. Uh, I'm curious. Have you ever had the desire to meet your father or things of that nature and have you met your biological father yeah so i met him when i was in my early 30s for the first time and when i met him it was a surprise meeting didn't last that long he passed away about 10 years ago something like that uh didn't have a relationship with him so i i wasn't missing it as an adult i wasn't missing it as a child, I missed it a great deal because I was a puny kid when I was growing up. So I was always getting bullied and it would have been nice to have a father there to, to kind of protect me. But 
as a result of not having a father, I saw the 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 bear in my mother come out because she was very protective. But I also learned to protect myself. I mean, I got in a lot of into a lot of fights, and I learned that I I had to build my body up, and that's what I did. I I started lifting weights so that bullies would stop bothering me, and the lifting of weights transformed my body and helped me to become a a football player that was formidable at that level. And, you know, I was, I was, I was a pretty good football player in high school and that got me the scholarship to go to BC, which opened up my world. So I have no regrets about not having a father. My mother did a heck of a job and it taught me how to fend for myself. You know, uh, now as a, as a, you know, I'm curious, as a parent, does that motivate you to be everything he wasn't? Or do you not even think about that kind of stuff anymore? Oh, no, it's the, it's a central point of my parenting is I want to be everything to my children that I didn't have in a father. Uh, because that really does help to shape. It could go, we could go wrong, it could go bad. You know, and we see a lot of kids who are negatively impacted by not having a father figure in the house. So I want, I always wanted to be that, that father, that great father for my kids. Uh, and, and hopefully I'm living up to that expectation. That's awesome. You know, the, the aspect of being disowned um, by your grandparents I'm curious, you know, was that something you knew at a young age, like your mother made you aware? Or was that later on in life you learned that, oh, the first five years they they didn't disown us? or And you learned that as a teenager or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I knew it as it was happening. Uh, those were those were five years that are etched in my memory. And and my grandmother, it was really my grandmother, my grandfather had to live with my grandmother so he had to go along with what she was doing but yeah. my my grandmother grew up as a foster child um in chicago she she that being a foster child for her played into her adulthood because she had so much shame that she was living with and so now as an adult she was thinking about how could she be a part of something she was she didn't want to be an outcast so where she lived there were no black people. She had black friends actually, you know, but they, they didn't live where she lived. Mm. Very monolithic neighborhood, very monolithic town where she lived. So she didn't allow my mother to bring me to the house. She was just embarrassed. She was embarrassed my mother ran away, had this young, had this child, black child out of wedlock. So I knew that I was not allowed over there for those first five years to the point where there were times they did they did whatever they could to help us in many ways like uh, at one point they they gave my mother um a volkswagen beetle a, a car it needed some work but it got us around and we and they would also allow us to go fill up because we were on welfare so 585 dollars per month we didn't have any money mm -hmm. so they would allow us to go to their local gas station to fill up the the tank and it was on their it was on their credit but when we went the gas station attendants couldn't see me so i had to go in the when we were rolling up to the gas station before we got there i would have to go into the crawl space behind my mother's seat and put a blanket over me and wow, wait yeah. until. So if you think about it, I, cause I've, I've gone through this in my memory banks. I remember they had a dog at the gas station. It was uh, Joe's gas station. They had this German shepherd and the dog loved children. So whenever parents would go get gas, the dog would, you know, kids would pet the dog. I never got to pet the dog. Yeah. And then they would also give out candy to the kids. Just, you know, nice little gestures for the kids, lollipops and stuff. I never got the candy. So I was always listening to the kids saying, I want a cherry, you know, lollipop or whatever. 
and I was in the back in the crawl space under a blanket. I could still smell the blanket. I know what that musty blanket smells like. And, and that was the case. We did this once per week, once every two weeks, I would have to go get in that, to that crawl space when my mother went to fill up the tank. And you think about how that impacts a kid when, you know, the self-esteem of a kid, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? So I know it played into my self-esteem. I'm fortunate that, very blessed that I was able to get get over it and get through it, but it taught me lessons. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially given what you do today, I'm curious, you know, obviously this family aspect of your life, obviously race is now becoming a very important part of you're very you're very knowledgeable of it as a young young kid um but in terms of your interactions with police um is that also something that you know you were well aware of as a you know as you're going up through high school or is this you know did the law and law enforcement all of that come later in life that interest I, I, I respected law enforcement when I was a kid, but I also saw some of my friends being eaten by the streets and some of them going to jail. And so when you see that, it, I, I, I didn't ever think I was going to become a law enforcement officer because I wanted to stay away from just that whole arena. And, um, and I didn't. I didn't plan on becoming one. It really came to me because I was recruited when I was in law school uh, by the FBI. And it was only because I thought at some point I debated whether I would, I would apply, but it fit me in many ways. They were seeking lawyers, people who were in decent shape and you know, folks who, who, were, who, who were called to do this kind of public service. But I didn't know that that's where I wanted to go. And then I thought about it. I said, you know what? Uh, I've seen my friends not necessarily be on, being on the right side of this thing. So maybe there's something I can do if I learn about the system from the inside out. I could learn the system and then make the system better because I didn't think the system was fair to vulnerable people. And that's why I did it. I did it so that I could learn the system basically. Yeah. And right. serve. That's awesome. So, you know, growing up in Yonkers, uh, I guess maybe talk to us about your your process with football and and uh, you know, you know, getting recruited to BC and you know, obviously the world is a lot different now. But just any advice you might have for a high school kid trying to play D one level college athletics. It, it came fast and furious for me. I, I was, I was really, I was, a, I was a small kid at one point. I started to grow a little bit. My mother's five one. My my biological father couldn't have been taller than five 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 six. We, it's not like we had football in our genes or anything. I would have been the first one to play football. I was the first one to play football, and um, so the process. I, I was just playing football because it was keeping me off the streets. And then when I started to get better at it and my speed started to um, in, increase and I saw that there might be an opportunity, I was getting recruited and in a flash, it seems like it was just in a flash, I was getting all these offers to, to play both Ivy's, West Point, Division One, and Boston College was, I didn't even know Boston College existed. And the recruiter, Kevin Lempa, Coach Lempa, came down and he showed me a poster of Doug Flutie because Doug just had a great sophomore year. And he said, he, this, this dude's going to be up for the Heisman. I was like, I don't even know where Boston College is. I, I, don't, I don't have any idea. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and then I, I started to do some research and BC had everything I wanted because it had academics and it had athletics. I was going to go to Pittsburgh because I wanted to be Tony Dorsett. Mm -hmm. He was my idol. He's the reason I played football and he went to Pittsburgh. But man, they had 
really stiff competition. Their, their, their athletes were just extraordinary, the ones they were recruiting. And I knew it would have been a tough, tough road to hoe for me. Uh, and then they pulled the scholarship at the last minute. So I, I didn't even have it as a choice. And then I was thinking, okay, where am I going to go? Yale, West Point. And it came down to Yale, West Point, BC. And BC had everything. It was the balanced institution. And it was only four hours away. And, and that's why I went there. How was the transition from uh, Yonkers to Chestnut Hill? <laughs> oh, it's just like, you know, I mean, a silly transition. It was, it was night and day. Uh, you, you, you know, well, I was used to places like Chestnut Hill because my grandparents lived in East Chester, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had a Scarsdale address. Gotcha. So Scarsdale is right there. So I saw Scarsdale and Chestnut Hill is like the Scarsdale of Boston. So I knew what it looked like, but to actually live there, to be surrounded by all that, I knew I, I hadn't that kind of exposure. So there was a learning curve that was pretty steep. I had to learn how to adjust. And um, I, I, I must say, it's one of the most beautiful places to go to school, Boston in general, but then Chestnut Hill within the Boston perimeter. It's really a nice place to go to school. And, um, and I enjoyed it. I, I made the right decision. Yeah. I guess, uh, tell us your, your, uh, maybe your favorite football moment, obviously playing with Doug Flutie and things of that nature. What was your favorite moment? It's a good question. You know, of course the, the Hail Mary pass, I wasn't even there for it, but it was still a great moment because I broke my hand. Mm -hmm. So I didn't travel for for that entire year, I was been red. I was redshirting that year, and uh, so I watched the game at my grandparents' place on a Friday night after after Thanksgiving. But my best moments, I think, uh, they were off field. They were they were off field. We we had so much fun. The the camaraderie was was really it was it was a powerful camaraderie that we had with the with not just the athletes but with students who were not athletes as well. I had basketball players and football players who were my roommates, but we, we associated with everybody. And so those were some of the best moments, really just hanging out with them yeah. off field, you know, and then I, I, uh, I had some, some interesting times on the field with, with my friends too. And we, we had three great years, one off year, but three great years where we went to bowls and we did pretty, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then a couple years later, you go to St. John's Law School. Um, just talk about your process there and um, how that came about. When I graduated from BC with an economics degree, I couldn't get a job. I, uh, I, I was interviewed by IBM, got the interview because Keith Barnett, a former football player, set it up for me. And I just blew the interview. I mean, I, I blew everything. I was late. I was, it was just an awful experience. They still called me back for a callback. I didn't get the job. I yeah. shouldn't have gotten the job because yeah. I didn't know. I wouldn't have known what I was doing. So I couldn't get a job. And I was graduating. And I was going to go back for my fifth year. But I started working as a bouncer over the summer. And when they asked me if I was going to come back for my fifth year, I said, you know what? I'm making some money. I never made money before in my mm. life. I said, I'm making some money. I'm just going to stay. Home. Mm. I didn't really want to play football anymore. And so I bounced for two years after I graduated from law school. And I also worked full time as, as a paralegal um, at a Wall Street law firm. And the combination of those two jobs, I made more money than I had ever made <laughs> in my life. Yeah. And, and the feel for that gave me a sense of empowerment and and so i was just i was content i was good that's what i wanted to do remember i grew up on welfare so i just wanted a job but my friend jay brusman told me you you you're not gonna be balanced for the rest of your life you gotta get a regular job you gotta do something you go to law school he's an attorney he said you gotta go to law school and he, he was on me every week when are you applying when are you applying and finally i just applied because i wanted to get him off my back and I applied to two schools. I got into both of them. St. John's was one of them. I decided to go to St. John's. They had a 
they had a two and a half year program. So I went through the summers, did it in two and a half years. And thank God I went to law school. Um, I learned how to read between Boston College and my law school. That's when I really learned how to read. I couldn't really read well going into college. I, it was all effort. Yeah. I, was, I was reading with a deficit. And uh, so I had to put in a lot of hours just trying to keep up with my friends. And unfortunately, I, it, I overcame it and I learned how to read in, at, at BC in law school and, um, and it changed my life. I'm schools. curious, you know, in those classes, I'm sure at times you might have been the only minority in the room. How do you not let that get to your head? You know, it, it, I I lived in two worlds as a kid. Once I was accepted by my grandparents the way they did, I, I would live with them on weekends and over the summers for weeks at a time. So I was around very monolithic uh you know, communities as a kid through my, through my adolescence and teen years, I, I knew what that felt like. So it wasn't, it wasn't anomalous for me. Uh, so I, I, I always had friends who were of different persuasions and yes, in, in my class, in my classes, actually as a, in high school, it was the same thing. There were, there was maybe another one maybe another two uh, person of color in my class. I was taking honors classes. And so mostly white, and it, the, the schools were not in my neighborhood. They were, mm. they were walking distance away, but they were far away, far walking distance. So when I go to Boston College and most of the classes are full of people who don't look like me, I was kind of used to it mm -hmm. and um, adapted as well as I could. I wasn't a great student. I was a decent student at BC, but you know, by the time I got out of BC in law school, I, I could read like I never could read before. It, it just, my life was transformed when I had that power. Yeah, that's awesome. And so after uh, you spend some time as an associate attorney, and then you ended up going into the FBI. Um, maybe just talk about your your time with the FBI. I mean, tons of people want to be <laughs> recruited to the FBI, and maybe what you learned uh, in your time there. I was very blessed because I applied when I was in my second year of law school and was accepted just out of... Um, just out of law school, about a year, year out of law school. And I was undercover for two and a half years. I, it was of my four years, I spent two and a half of them working undercover. And it was surreal at times, I have to admit, because I played cops and robbers as a kid when I was very young. And I remember some of my most, the favorite shows I had were you too young to know these shows. They might be on like some of those some of those cable stations that people don't watch. But like Beretta, Starsky and Hutch, SWAT. These these are shows that were extremely popular when I was a young boy, and they were cop shows. And so we used to play Beretta, Starsky and Hutch, and SWAT. And and to find myself actually as a cop, a federal cop, was surreal a gun, a badge, a, a, they give you a car. And, and then when I'm undercover, I'm doing stuff that is, it's, it's Twilight Zone kind of stuff when you start. I had to pinch myself that I was doing it. And then I got used to it after a while. The lessons learned, I learned how to, learned how to adapt to people very quickly. Um, I learned a lot about the federal government a lot about the law enforcement industry. And, and I took those lessons with me throughout my, my life, not just my career, but my life. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I will, I guess, do you wanna talk about, obviously I'm gonna get to D2C, but uh, maybe as well talk about, you know, from the FBI, you moved to the NFL, 
the Jaguars and, and the NBA before you started D2C. So you want to just talk about, about um, I guess, you know, maybe why you made those moves and, you know, if anybody can, I guess, learn from anything you learn from those places. Well, yeah, I, and my mother is a relationship expert. She just knows how to create relationships. She passed that down to my brother and me. And it's because of relationships that I had all these various opportunities. Uh, from the FBI, I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor, never prosecuted a case before, never, never tried a case. I didn't really practice. I practiced for less than a year out of law school. And here I find myself within two weeks of being in the office having to try cases. And it was because of a relationship that I had built while I was an FBI agent that I had that opportunity. I, I wasn't looking for, for that opportunity. It came to me. And then the same thing happened with the NFL and the Jacksonville Jaguars and the NBA. All relationships, people who I knew who, who asked me if I would be interested in, in working with them. And it just underscores the importance of establishing relationships in one's life that are genuine, not not just superficial relationships and not just when you need something kind of relationships, relationships for the sake of being, having good people in one's life. It's so important. And, and my entire life has been based on the relationships I keep to determine my destiny without a doubt, not just my pro professional life, but my personal life. So I'm, I'm very fortunate that I had those opportunities, but it was because my mother taught me and my brother, how to form substantive, successful, and sustainable relationships. So I, I do those things in sports. I always wanted to be in sports. And it came to me. It came a little bit earlier than I thought, but it came to me. And then my, my buddy, Chris Palmer, who is, Chris recruited me when I was in the ninth and 10th grade. He started coaching me at, at camps. He was very close to my head coach uh, in high school. And Chris was a defensive back coach at Colgate University. So in the 11th grade, he started to actually recruit me. He, he wanted me to go to Colgate. And um, I ultimately decided to go to BC because he told me to go to BC instead of thinking about some of the other schools I was thinking about. And then Chris and I are reunited because he becomes a, a, a football coach in the NFL. So we're reunited at the Jacksonville Jaguars where he's the offensive coordinator. And I'm in the front office and he sits down in my office one day and he says, and we're friends at, at this point. And he says, uh, just so you know, I, I, and he said this out of the blue, just so you know, you are nobody in sports until somebody fires you. That's the rule. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what, where is this coming from? In sports, you are nobody in some, until somebody fires you. And he's a coach, so he's used to three-year stints. He's going to be fired. There's going to be a new coach. He's going to lose. They're going to, he's going to move on. Or he, he may take another job. Sooner or later, he's going to get fired. Players get fired. 99.9% .9 of players get fired. There are only a couple of players in the history of the NFL who decided they were going to leave before it was time to leave. And Barry Sanders was one of them. And Jim Brown was another. And so I, I didn't know how that applied to me. I was in the front office until I got fired by the NBA. And I was like, man, Chris was right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's just inevitable that it's gonna happen to most people in sports. So when that happened to me, it was a rude awakening. It was just, it floored me. And fortunately I I'd already started to build a media company, but it still floored me. I, I thought I was gonna be a, a GM and then team president and maybe an owner one day. So it threw me off track, but what it did was it forced me to become an entrepreneur because I couldn't get hired by, at the level I wanted to, I couldn't get hired. And, and the people who wanted to hire me were lawyers who wanted me to run sports practices, but they were just gonna steal my contacts. So I was forced to become an entrepreneur and I didn't know what an entrepreneur was really, but I yeah. learned, I learned that, quickly. That's awesome. I'm I'm curious just for my own selfish fun, you know, were, did you interact with like, what was it, Paul um, Tagliabue? Yes. Did you do you interact with um, like David Stern or any any? Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. So how, Paul, how was that? It, it was it was a surreal experience. Uh, it really was because the job that I had when I was hired by the NFL required me to travel a lot to because I was in charge of helping to create, but then communicating off field misconduct policy. So we started with the violence policy, which is now the personal conduct policy. And I was in charge of communicating that policy to ownership down to players. So I was going to the practice facilities across the nation and I was having meetings with ownership and with players and with coaches. So one day I'm watching these folks on TV, I'm rooting for them. I, you know, and the next day I'm having meetings with them. So it was a pretty surreal experience. And with Paul, Paul was the one who wanted to craft that violence policy. So he said, can you take a first crack at it? So I took the first crack at the violence policy. And then I go up with my boss, I go up to his office and he is editing it in front of me. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I mean, this is how, how is this happening that I'm one day I'm, I'm rooting for these teams and now I'm in the commissioner's office crafting policy with them. And it's funny because full circle, Paul and I work together now in many ways. I brought him down to the, to the, the FBI Academy to lecture on behalf of D D2C and we do stuff together. Uh, when it comes to social justice, he's very much into justice and how we can get to a place of equity. So I work with him a decent amount and he's you now getting now going into the Hall of Fame. So I'll yeah. see him at the Hall of Fame. Very proud of him. And and he he gave me he gave me my shot. Uh, he really has been so kind to me. When you, uh, you know, are working, you know, and I, I don't know if you admired some of these guys, but like, you know, what was it? Jimmy Smith, Keenan McCardale, uh, you know, guys like that. I mean, is it because I think was it Jimmy that had a lot of off the field issues? But regardless, like, I mean, I think in some of those roles, you may have had to have been stern to the player. Is it tough because you also admire them in terms of their their football abilities? Yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm truthful. As a, the, the balance with me is I'm not going to, I'm going to shoot you straight. I'm not going to tell you something that's not true. And it's all about respect. I respect them so much, not just as athletes, but as people. And Jimmy had some issues. He had those, those issues came to light after I left the Jaguars. We had the most incredible team during those years from 98 to 2001 in Jacksonville. I mean, you think about Mark Brunell, Tony Baselli, Fred Taylor, Keenan McCardo, Jimmy Smith, Leon Searcy, Hardy Nickerson, we, uh, Tony Brackens, Kevin Hardy. We had such a team, we were, we were 14 and two, mm -hmm. and we lost twice to the Tennessee, Tennessee Titans. They just had our number. And then we go to the championship game, we play them again at home, and we lose again. So we only lost three games that year, and they were all playoffs and regular season, all to the Tennessee Titans. And Blaine Bishop, who uh, is a buddy of mine now, who played for the Tennessee Titans, I always tell him I hated him because he was on those Titans teams, and he always played loaded for bear against us. He was incredible, and he's one of the reasons why we always lost. Mm. They just had our number. But yeah. these, these, these young men, at the time were just such great athletes and extraordinary people at the same time, wonderful role models. And, and some had like Jimmy had some issues afterwards, but he's, he's gotten it together and he's learned and his lessons that he's teaching everybody else. He's a good person. And, um, and I'm proud to know him. I'm proud to know all those, those gentlemen. Yeah. When you're at a, a level like team president, you know, of a, you know, I think at that time it was a D league organization, you know, how do you handle so much responsibility? Are you, I mean, do you have a personal life? Do you ha like, how, how is, how is that process when you're, at, you know, team president, you know? Yeah, I, I'm, we were working all the time because we were launching a league and there were some 
major barriers with, with launching that league. And it's now come along and now the D league is the G league and the G league is doing fine. And it's, they have alignment with the, with the teams in the NBA, which is the way it should be. But yeah, it was very stressful. Uh, a lot of, a lot of hours by everybody, the whole staff, but it was something that we enjoyed doing too. We enjoyed, we enjoyed it again, camaraderie. I was learning how to be a manager. I didn't quite know how to do it. And that taught me the do's and don'ts of it all. And, and then that all comes down to just being honest with people and, and being respectful and, and ensuring that you command respect as well. So life, life was stressful, but I wouldn't change it for anything. No regrets. Yeah. And so right after that, you start doing entrepreneurial uh, companies like your media company and then D2C, you know, talk about what, what was the incentive for starting D2C? D2C, I, I, we just wanted to, as a family, we wanted to find ways through education to empower members of society in the area of justice. Uh, it, it was very important to utilize the resources we had. One of those being my background to bring people together. And so D2C became that vehicle. And now it's grown so much and it, it gives us an opportunity to have to affect change, real impactful change in an area that is perhaps the most relevant area of today. If you think about, the, especially the law enforcement community uh, relations aspect of this, it might be the most relevant issue of the day. And we get to have these conversations with law enforcement and the community, and we don't stop at conversations. Those conversations roll into action. And so action, the call to action is how we, how we, the outcome we see. And we've had great, great response from both audiences together and independently about this work and how we can change the dynamic right now between law enforcement and I'm curious, cute, like for someone out there that wants to start a nonprofit, you know, what advice would you have? Because obviously you're doing a great job. You know, you start, I'm sure you started by yourself. And now I think I saw on the website, you know, 21 employees, um, you're landing partnerships with, you know, Boston College, you're, you know, working with the biggest, you know, police departments talk to him about year one through three and you know if someone's looking to start a nonprofit, what would if you had to go back now knowing all the knowledge you have today how would you maybe expedite your process the, the one thing i didn't fully understand about the not-for-profit world is that the organizations that call themselves not-for-profits are businesses. They're businesses with tax exempt ability. So they, they don't get taxed because of certain compliance issues that they're, they're readily accepting, but they're businesses. They have to be run like businesses for sustainability. The difference is you also get donations. So you can charge fees, but you, but you also get donations. And, and so if I would, would have known that it may have accelerated things a little bit, but I had to learn the hard way. And so that's okay. We got to this place where lessons are learned, but the, the business aspect of it is so important. It is an entrepreneurial enterprise. Whenever you're starting up any kind of business, whether it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit, it's an entrepreneurial enterprise. You have to give the public what is in demand in order to be able to survive. And we just happen to be in this space where we provide solutions for some of the most relevant issues of the day. And there's a great deal of demand for it. How did your you know, business model change in those early years? And how were you able to, I guess, hire your first employee? I think that's a huge milestone for anyone just starting out with their nonprofit? 
we um, we weren't even a formalized not for profit for for several years. We were doing this just to give back, educate. So we'd hold forums and things of that sort. And then I met some folks. I was introduced to some folks who said, "You know what? We want to help you with what you're doing because it's so important." And this wasn't even in the law enforcement arena. This was more about how do we work to achieve upward economic mobility for certain vulnerable uh, segments of society. And so they helped to shepherd us through the processes and took us under their umbrella so that we could be receive the benefits of a not-for-profit. So they were our fiscal sponsor for quite a few years. And we learned the business under their guidance. It was just spectacular that they would do this for us. And when they felt we were ready, they said, okay, now it's time for you to do it. So they threw us out of the nest. And, but they, they didn't throw us completely out of the nest. They were still there. Our chairperson right now is, is the person who did this for us. And so when, we, when it was time for us to fly, we knew what to expect. And you know now as a 501c3, the, the timing couldn't be better to do this work yeah. because everybody is demanding it. Yeah. How did you think about you know, your board of directors and um, what was your thought process there? Well, I wanted people, because I know a lot hinges on my background, who I am, my ability to teach, my ability to, so I wanted to, bring people around who around me and into D2C who could complement and supplement what I was about and then ultimately could run with it without me because this isn't about me, it's about all of us. So the trusted people in my life who I thought could do that were the people I asked to come aboard either on staff or as board members. And They've, they've agreed to do it. These, these are busy people, but it comes down to, again, friendships and relationships and people who trust what I'm, I was trying to accomplish. And so that's, that's how I was able to get people involved. I, I had to have trust for them. They were trusted friends, but not only that, they, I trusted them in a way where they would make D2C accountable for everything it does. So that includes me. So if they disagree with me, they tell me they disagree with me. We might still disagree on, but they're gonna voice it. They're gonna say it. They're not gonna hold it. They're not yesing me to death. They want us to succeed. And those diverse perspectives are so important when, when you start up a business. Yeah. You know, at the point where you are today, where you're, as I said, landing major colleges and obviously major police departments and things of that nature, you know, obviously the curriculum that you have has to be pretty strong and your, you know, the organization's reputation has to be pretty strong. Can you talk about how you, you know, came about with that and maybe what were some keys to, you know, establishing your credibility um, to form these partnerships? Well, it was over the course of, you know, the last 20 years that this has all come to fruition. And, and there are a lot of people involved from the beginning through the middle to now, just hundreds of people involved. And um, so we developed this curriculum over the course of time. It started at an elementary level and it's just manifest into something with great depth and relevance and it's digestible. And so folks embrace it because it's simple. We give solutions that are simple. That's the key, conceptually simple. Doesn't mean it's e they're easy to execute, but when you have a strategy that's simple, when it's time to implement it, at least you have confidence that conceptually you can do it and then the basis for it all is in relationship. We teach people how to build relationships, basically. And we know relationships take time. 
that time that it takes, though, if you have a game plan for how to build relationships, it makes it more feasible to build really successful relationships. So that's what we do. And it's evolved over time to the point where this is all about relationships. It wasn't always that way. And there are many pieces to it and many people have contributed. Yeah. I guess as you look at the landscape of our society today, you know, obviously communities, trust of police and law enforcement isn't great everywhere. Uh, I guess for you being in this space, you know, what advice do you have for law enforcement and maybe what advice do you have for the community? I think we we need to first, the first thing we need to do is we need to commit to the outcomes we seek to have. So we want outcomes. What are the outcomes? What are the solutions? Let's break it down to, to its simplest form, relationships. People talk about anti-racism and implicit bias and getting rid of all that stuff. Yes. That'll all happen if we have substantive, successful, sustainable relationships with each other. You don't have those issues if you first handle relationships. So how do you get to that place of meaningful relationship? Well, you can look at it and say, what, what's the first step? Where do we start? And we say you have to start with listening. Just listening to each other. We, this is, again, this isn't rocket science. I'm not a rocket scientist. Given my history of difficulty with reading, I mean, I, I was never the most intelligent guy in the room. Simple conceptual and uh, simple concepts and practical concepts are my key to life. That's it. So this is a simple concept. Listening and listening beautifully is the first step to getting to that place of meaningful relationship building. And the problem is right now today with the divisiveness that's going on folks are going in the opposite direction instead of coming together closer to the middle as one community listening to each other they're yelling at each other that must be the paradigm shift to start this thing we have to start listening beautifully to each other because once we listen beautifully, we'll learn and understand. And then that gives rise to empathy. And as we gain that empathy, we can start to acknowledge some of the issues that we have, the issues of the past, how we got here. And once we get to the point where we fully acknowledge how we got here, we've learned from the past, we're not going to make the same mistakes in the future, we can take action. And we say taking action with mean, for meaningful relationships means you have to do it with vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. You have to be vulnerable enough with courage to express one's, your pain and to allow others to reveal their pain to you. When we listen to people beautifully, we learn and understand, we acknowledge, and then we take action with vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. That's the simple ingredient those are the simple ingredients in this recipe for reconciliation that we teach to get to that place of trust healing and reconciliation pain is the key if we understand that struggles challenges and pain are a part of the human experience we all go through them we'll understand that that's the connective tissue too we all go through it's a common denominator for us all so when i look at you and I hear your pain, I can feel it, and you can feel my pain, we're gonna grow closer together because we have that in common. Just think of any meaningful relationship you have in life. There's pain and vulnerability interwoven in those relationships. You know, for the community member that looks at Andrew Brown, Elijah McLean, um, you know, so many others, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, you know, obviously George Floyd. And they have a distrust for law enforcement and they feel that it's a systemic issue. 
you know, how do you, you know, reach those types of people? Well, there are systems in place that have been created for a purpose. And we have to derail those systems that are not looking at an outcome of equity. Um, and maybe we have to reimagine those systems as we're, we hear many people say. And so again, here's, here's the key. If we talk about the pain that folks are going through, then it's about that pain. So when, when somebody says, I don't trust law enforcement, it's not for me to say, you need to trust law enforcement. It's for me to say, I wanna listen to your pain. Tell me about your experiences. It's not for me to be defensive about it. It's for me to say, please enlighten me, tell me, because I want the same respect in return. I want you to listen to my pain as a law enforcement officer too. I want law enforcement to listen to my pain as a black person, as a black man, as a black man who as a FBI agent was arrested in Newport for fitting the description of somebody. There's pain that everybody feels. So if we listen to that pain, now we're strengthening the bond, we're connecting in ways that we hadn't connected before and trust is being, is brewing, it's being built. So the person who says, you know, I don't trust police. And we say, well, that's, those are just bad apples. You shouldn't, no, that's not the answer. The answer is, tell me about that. Tell me about that because I want to understand why. I want to, I want to really get to the reason so I can understand who you are, put myself in your shoes. And you know, when somebody really hears you when they're listening to you, you gain trust for them when it's genuine. And that's where we need to be. So I wanna hear the pain. Oftentimes we're in these sessions with law enforcement and community because we put them together. We don't do them independently, we put them together. And there's pain being expressed by all parties about what's going on. And we have to at times stop the other party from interrupting with defensiveness because we want everybody to listen to the pain. Listen to the pain, that pain will connect us ultimately. You know, if if you were to give advice to a, a police department, someone listening to this right now, on what's one thing that they can do to have better community relations, does something come to mind? It's exactly what I just said. Listen to the pain first. It's that listening beautifully, learn, understand. When you listen beautifully, you're going to hear pain. Listen to it because that will reveal who that person is. And it'll also give them a feeling of empowerment that you're listening to them. You really care. Everybody wants to know that other people care about them. That's big. So, we, this is what we embed in our curriculum is listen to the pain, listen to it so that you can then respond appropriately and not with defensiveness. And so you can then in a safe environment, express your own thing and they'll listen to you. Yeah. So instead of now we're talking at each other, we're listening to each other. So it's a complete shift. Do you want to talk about your, your book, um, how not to get killed by the police? and what readers can learn from that? Sure, I, I, I wrote the book as an essay for my son. It's 31 pages, so it's, it's really short. But I, I gave four, four of my stories, four stories when I was either arrested or detained or approached by, the, by law enforcement. And one of those stories was, you know, I was an FBI agent and I was, I was arrested and to, to know that I could give advice to folks who might be in a similar situation and that advice could help them to get home safely. I wrote the book for my son because I wanted him to get home safely when it was his time to drive. And he's only eight right now. 
but I wanted him to prepare him. And I wanted also to prepare him to build relationships. Because if we think about the 20 second interaction with the law enforcement officer, you're building a relationship in those 20 seconds. It could be a good one or a bad one. It could be determinant of your life for the rest of your life, or it could be just something that passes in that 20 seconds, or it could be something very positive for the rest of your life. So I wanted him to learn about establishing relationships and especially with law enforcement. So I wrote this book. There are four of my stories in there. And I, that's how I teach. I teach through story, always talking about different stories in my life. And I get this because my mother has all these stories. So I, I tell the stories of our life together. And, and the book is distributed to law enforcement. It's distributed to communities. Everybody uses it because embedded in it is how to get home safely. And that's why I wrote it for my son. because I always want, want him to get home safely. I have a daughter too. I want both of them to get home safely. And, uh, and fortunately, even with a provocative title, How Not to Get Killed by the Police, and the title was, was, it was named that because I had clients who were calling me at two in the morning asking me, how do I not get killed by the police when they get pulled over? So there's a reason behind the title. I didn't do it to be provocative. I did it knowing it would be. And um, law enforcement, they actually hand the book out to high school students. They believe that much in it because they don't judge it by its cover. They judge it by its contents. The contents tell folks how to get home safely, tell folks what to do during traffic stops, how to comply. And it also serves as a reminder to law enforcement about the pain that communities feel when it comes to interacting with law enforcement. Yeah. Um, Q, is there anything else in this, you know, topic, you know, obviously this is what you do day to day, but that you'd like to talk about that maybe I haven't thought of as a question? Well, we, we've we expanded what we do to, to folks beyond law enforcement. So it's not about just law enforcement community, it's about corporations and academia. We, we have a great, uh, opportunity that Boston College and D2C, we've partnered to provide education to all of the student athletes, coaches, and front office personnel in the athletics department, which is, for me, coming home is more than spectacular. Yeah. So I get to come to come up to BC every 45 to 60 days, and we, we hold sessions with, with the athletics department personnel and the players. Uh, student athletes. So there's a lot that we're doing outside the arena of law enforcement community. It's really about justice. It's about justice, social, criminal, procedural. It's about how we can bring people together and do it in an equitable way. Yeah, no, that's awesome that you're expanding into corporations. Um, you know, as you mentioned your kids, I, I thought of this, you know, so much of your story comes from, you know, growing up in Yonkers, living on welfare. As you think about your kids, have you thought of, like, how do you think you'll instill that type of work ethic that you had for them? Because their their dad's, you know, a former... NFL, NBA executive, he's running, you know, a nonprofit. Have you thought about how to instill that same, you know, motivation that you've had throughout all of your life? Well, I, I just want to be there to support them. So I support them, but actions really, that that's where I see life. I see life through action and they see me working a lot. They see me constantly traveling and teaching and speaking and, um, you know, running a law firm and a media company and, and a not-for-profit and, and a consultancy. So when they see all of that, they see the hard work. I do whatever I, I can for them because my prince and my princess, they are it for me. So whatever I could do for them, but at the same time, I want them to appreciate what they have 
without overdoing it. And so they have an appreciation. There's a reminder about that appreciation all the time. And they see how hard I work to provide for them and to help society. I want them to come out of this saying, you know what, it's not all about just making money and, and me, me, me. It's about what can we do for the betterment of society? How do we serve? Yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, the other question I had when you mentioned your children was, I thought about LeBron and, um, you know, when his LA home had the N word um, sprayed all over it. I'm curious, you know, at that point, I remember interviews that LeBron did around that time that he ended up having conversations with his kids at that point. I'm curious, you know, for you, do you have any advice on that for, you know, parents of minority children? Yeah, I, my, I'm 55 years old and I, I believe that it's very important to be transparent. So, you know, I tell, I tell my story in a transparent way because it is my story. I held on to that story for many years without telling people about the deficits I had and the shame I had and challenges. But now it's all about transparency. So I, I think handling societal issues in a transparent way is, is prudent. Even though my kids are now they're eight and seven, going on nine and seven, being transparent with them. My daughter asks about death a lot. She's she's not fascinated by it, but she's wondering what is it, you know, who dies, why do they die, how old are they, what are my expectations? She's very mature in the way she looks at, at life. She looks at the continuum of life. And so we have discussions. We have discussions I have with a seven-year-old, but four or seven-year-old, but with transparency, not hiding. And, she, and, and she's still very innocent in many ways. Um, you know, we're looking forward to Santa Claus coming in, in December. So there's that transparency that we have to offer to our next generation. We have to offer them the truth. They know when, the, when we're not talking, speaking the truth. So we have to give the truth. And if we do that, I think that will help them to be better leaders because then they'll do that when they, when they get older. One other question selfishly I had, you know, um, most of my listeners are in the 25 to 34 year old range. So they are working pretty hard in their professional career. You know, now, you know, being married, having kids, you know, how, any advice do you have for, for that? I mean, even 25 to 40 year olds, you know, working to progress, you know, maybe to the levels that you've been at, you know, where you've been a manager at a, at the NFL, you've been a director of player administration for an NFL team. You've been a team president. You're now, you know, running, um, as, as a CEO, a nonprofit, um, any, pieces of advice on, you know, trying to try to have a normal personal life while you try to grow professionally? Yeah, it's very easy to get caught up in just working. There is a balance that has to always be taken in, into consideration. Uh, living with some sense of balance, finding that balance is, is important. But 25 to 34, I mean, you're in the thick of it right there, going full speed ahead. So I get that. Do that. Learn, learn your profession and become really good at it. But it should never always be about just your profession. Do we define ourselves by our profession? That's always a question I have. When I, when I ask people, who are you? And if they give what they do, that tells that they define themselves by that profession. And so we have to consider, how do we define ourselves? Do we define ourselves as a person, the humanness of who we are, or is, is our career, whatever that is? And once we figure out how we define ourselves, that helps us to see if we need to balance. If we need to change the balance there a little bit. Balance is really important. Yeah, 
Oh, that's a great answer. Uh, Q, we, we talked about a good amount. Was there something that um, you wanted to talk about that we didn't? Well, if anybody's interested in, in visiting us uh, at dedicationtocommunity.org, uh, that will give you more information about what we're doing, what we've done. And if anybody wants to join in this movement with us, because it is a movement, it's a global movement, it's a mission, please feel free to, to give us a call and join us because we, we need the village. This is about the village. Yeah, no, oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, cute. I just want to acknowledge you and, and thank you for, for coming on. Uh, it's, you've got quite an impressive story, you know, from Yonkers, a uh, single parent household to BC law school, um, FBI, NFL, NBA, and now running your own nonprofit. And so, um, thank you for sharing your story and, uh, best of luck with everything going forward. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And, and God bless you what you're doing, you know, bringing these conversations to the public uh, to, to help others figure out what their pathway may be. It's great work. Thank you.